Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the Canadian Open Data Society's pre-summit workshop number two, Designing Classroom Learning Opportunities Using Open Data. Uh, my name is Paul Connor, and I am Executive Director of the Society. And uh, with me today, we have uh, Anna Duff and Gabby Resch from Ontario Tech University, who will be uh, conducting the presentation today. And uh, I'm grateful also to have the presence of Connie McCutcheon, uh, my fellow board director with the Open Data Society, who will be uh, backing me up on this uh, presentation. Uh, a few words about the society. Uh, we founded uh, late last year uh, after two years of work, uh, which followed the previous Open Data Summit in Niagara in 2018, which Connie and I both worked on while we were working down there. And uh, it was their uh, belief, the collected uh, delegates to that summit, that we should have a permanent organization at this point to develop ultimately a community of practice. And in some small way, uh, I do hope that this particular workshop contributes greatly to that uh, community of practice and expands it uh, to the educational community that's starting to take an interest in uh, open data affairs. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Anna and uh, Gabby. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop. So my name is Anna Dapp. I'm a teaching professor at Ontario Tech University. Um, I typically teach uh, first year courses in math, everyone's favorite subject, uh, especially to my students, um, who are typically in uh, business studies or uh, networking and IT security. So not super science uh, oriented, uh, etc. So we'll be addressing some of those um, aspects uh, later on in the workshop. Gabby, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gabby Resch. I am a new assistant professor at Ontario Tech, uh, also in the Faculty of Business and Information Technology. Uh, I've been working probably about the last six years or so, uh, five, six years teaching in the area of human centered data visualization at U of T. Um, so my primary area of work is in data visualization. Um, and I have a particularly strong interest in new modes of, of interacting with data, especially with respect to getting, uh, you know, uh, facilitating uh, uh, opportunities for developing data literacy. So that's a, a big core interest of mine, which is why I'm excited about this workshop. So that's me. Um, so I don't know, I think people may like maybe still trickling in, but maybe we could we could get going. It looks like we got a good crew. By no all problem. means. Yeah. Okay. So, Gabby, would you mind um, moving to the next slide? Yep. So, uh, let me just talk about briefly about what we're going to do today. Uh, so, Gabby and I are going to start off with giving you a really brief synopsis of some of the data, open data projects we have done in our classrooms. Uh, whether it's a classroom that is completely unrelated to uh, data literacy, but we want to use data, or it's a classroom that is focused on uh, improving the skill set in data literacy. Um, so after that, we're going to look on gathering some collective experience, and we're going to try and do that in two ways. First, we're going to give you a short Google Form survey to fill out. Um, a five minute survey and then uh, we're going to walk you through an example uh, and actually ask you to complete a certain series of tasks and the reason for that is we want to be able to collectively then think about well what are the some of the challenges that we as instructors would face in creating these projects and what are the challenges where we should expect that the students might have and how do we help them overcome those challenges and then finally we just uh, do a, a quick wrap up of sort of the collective uh, learning that we have done in the workshop hopefully we can able to we will be able to share that then with the wider audience uh, and so the other educators can use it uh, learning from your experience and ours yeah. So um, I will start off with the examples. I will talk about three examples 
of uh, projects that I've done in my courses. So I, what I teach is first year math courses in business and uh, networking and IT streams. Uh, the students that are coming into my courses don't have any statistics background. They have very limited background in um, visualization tools in data, uh, uh, working with data tools like Excel or Desmos, very limited. So if I want to use uh, data, open data in any of the projects, I have to really think carefully about my tasks that I'm providing uh, them with and how I present them. So uh, here's you know, a couple of examples. So you can see, for example, the first, uh, there's a um, handwritten, so one of the projects, they could just submit handwritten answers, but they had to look up the data and then they had to do some, perform some mathematical um, process that was part of our learning outcomes. And in the others, on the left, there is an image from Desmos, using Desmos as a visualization tool. Uh, and also linear regression tool, and on the right is um, Excel. So Gabby, would you mind just uh, moving forward? Um, so as I said, first year math courses, really limited skill set, okay, that I have among my students, um, but I want them to get excited about the stuff we are doing, learning in a math, so mathematical methods, how do those relate to real life? So for example, one of them is Canadian household spending. So looking at my question, my learning outcomes in a course are talking about calculating a percent change. Um, so I can give them a problem or I can send them to Statistics Canada and I can say, hey, can you guys figure, it, figure out um, what was the percent change in a typical Canadian household spending between two years? Um, and, you know, there's no high tech uh, use there. They just got to be able to get the, get the data, understand the data, and then apply it in the mathematical context. So that's a very quick application. Uh, the other two that I have are extensive projects, actually. So they would take students oh, a few weeks, and they tend to be uh, independent. So I don't teach them in class. I give them a set of instructions and they tell them, okay, you follow these instructions, submit your work. Um, so one of them, so Canadian CPI versus uh, earnings modeling, we are actually going to be using that data set later on. Um, but I use that in my business math class uh, when we talk about modeling using linear equations because it's a math class. In the second one about household mobile subscriptions, I use that in my calculus classes for my business and networking and IT students. Uh, first of all, how do we model using different types of functions? So why do we have different types of functions? Which one's the most appropriate for this model and why? How do we calculate rates of change, um, even derivatives, uh, so complex using uh, the differentiations rules, et cetera, is in that project. So that's all I'm gonna say about it. I use, you can see I can use Excel in one of them. I use Desmos in another. Um, these projects are shared through a shared um, samples of these projects. So the project instructions and sample of students' works are in a Google folder. I am going to uh, share shortly a uh, link to in the chat. So you can go and look at those later on, use them if you want to, they're open um, and see if they're helpful. Okay, Gabby. All right, uh, you guys can hear me good, I hope. Um, so I'm in a very similar boat. I, uh, I teach primarily students who are interested in sort of uh, information, data science, human computer interaction, uh, user experience design, but not specifically, you know, other than some data science students I have, I don't have students who are, are coming in specifically focused on data related uh, topics or themes or questions. So often the reason I'm using open data in my teaching is because it complements some other uh, uh, curriculum or, or, or goals that I, uh, that I have. So in, in the case of the visual examples here, now these are all coming from courses that I teach on, on visualization. 
uh, and, and particularly on data design, um, on, on new modes of, uh, of, of designing around, you know, let's say census data and, and, uh, 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 and, and social science data and so on. Uh, so just, I'll describe these projects in a, a second, um, but these are all over the last couple of years, they're primarily, I guess in, in each of these cases, these are with master's students uh, at U of T who would have been in classes focused on, on kind of new methods of design. Um, so on the left, we this, this sort of circle packed diagram um, that's showing, it's, it's actually taken from, the data is, is from uh, a neighborhood profiles data set that the city of Toronto shares. Uh, it's drawn directly from uh, the, the Canada census. So this would be 2016 census data um, for the, uh, the primary languages. I believe this one is probably uh, secondary languages spoken in the household in the city of Toronto. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, that's a, a very similar kind of data representation, if you will. Um, those are comparisons showing population growth on the bottom. And I actually might be easier if I just show you some examples here because I have some similar ones, but these were projects that were done around uh, showing the city of Toronto and population growth between 2011 and 2016 in specific neighborhoods. Again, data taken from the city of Toronto's open data portal. Um, top right, I have students do a project around immunization in Toronto school. So the, the city shares immunization data from the TDSB and I guess the, the Catholic school board as well. Uh, and, and what I have my students do is examine all the various factors that lead to certain schools having higher vaccination rates for specific vaccinations versus other ones. And, and this, uh, this one on the top right was actually part of a, a project where students were first learning about that immunization data set and then ultimately learning how to create their own sort of manipulative, deceptive graphics, the sort of misinformation stuff that you would see circulating uh, by the anti-vaxxer community online. Uh, so I, I taught them a number of methods um, for, for how to create disinformation, misinformation campaigns and so on. Um, and in that process, they had to examine what are good visualization practices that prevent this sort of graphical deception. So that's what this, uh, this top right one was from, from that, uh, that exercise. So here's a little description of the, uh, the actual exercises. So the, the context, it is in a graduate classroom, primarily master's students. I've had a couple PhD students over the years, but mostly master's students. Um, many of them are coming in with some basic uh, design and stats background, but I don't set that as uh, as a kind of preliminary barrier to entry. So they don't have to have a you know stats 404 or whatever. You know they 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 basically should have a little bit of uh, statistical slash data literacy. Um, for those who don't, if if I have a student who let's say has a background in graphic design and they're in a user experience design program. I'll typically have them do some uh, some prep work. So I'll, I'll have them do, you know, a data camp course or a, uh, a LinkedIn learning uh, course on, you know, that covers some of those those uh, those sort of prerequisites. Um, most of them don't have an extensive background with information visualization. Some of them will have some graphic design background, but not really uh, focused specifically on InfoViz. Um, and most of them, their their concept of data and how it works in the wild, um, you know, where to find it, what what open data is, what big data, all these sort of things, it's still relatively new. So their data literacy uh, is probably better than most because they're in a you know in in a, a sort of data science or an information science graduate program, but they're still relatively you know they're they're not uh, they're not statisticians, they're not uh, actively working yet. Uh, in a professional context, so their their data literacy skills are still they're 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 emerging in most cases. Um, so the so the three examples, and I've shared uh, like Anna, I've shared some stuff in the project work folder, uh, including one assignment that was the the one I described about misinformation. Um, and what we've got here, the the first one is more of an exercise. It's an in class exercise that I do. 
um, where I have them go to the City of Toronto's open data portal and access the page that's, uh, that, that provides the immunization data set for the schools. And my goal is to get them to, uh, to think about why, let's say, all the alternative schools have much lower vaccination rates. Okay, that's a question I love to throw at them. Hey, how come, you know, Alpha Alternative has a 40 or 50% religious uh, exemption rate? Is that because there are a bunch of religious kids that go to this alternative school? So I want them to really think about their relationship or their experience with alternative schools, let's say, um, with different communities in the city and, and have a kind of grounding before they do the work. Um, so my goal ultimately is to get them to explore in class some different ways to compare these vaccination rates. So, uh, so that, that previous here, I'll just uh, skip back here for one second. This previous one up at the top here, this is really a comparison tool. All the schools with high vaccination rates at the top, all the schools with low vaccination rates at the bottom. Um, so I want them to really be able to compare and visualize differences between schools. And they're not using a ton of really complicated tools for this. Uh, they have to do some internet searching. They have to be able to go to the open data portal and, and, uh, and work with it. And then I, I use uh, Plotly. Plotly has a great data studio tool uh, that I find works well because I teach the course in Python uh, and Plotly has great Python tools as well. So just as a graphical user interface, I get them to use Plotly's uh, uh, data studio tool that, uh, that allows them to do some, some graphical uh, uh, visualization. So that's our, our primary tools there. Uh, the second stuff, it's all related to the neighborhood demographics, the neighborhood profiles uh, data set, which even though it's shared by the, the city of Toronto and its open data portal, comes directly from StatsCan from the census. Uh, and, and typically there we are doing in-class mapping exercises. So I'm teaching them how to build data maps, uh, choropleth maps in particular, uh, but a variety of different data maps. And, and so my goal is to get them thinking about spatial data, uh, about how different neighborhoods relate to each other. And again, to have that grounding to what's going on in the real world, right? If, if you're mapping language, for example, you know, do you know uh, why why people are speaking more Urdu in, say, Regent Park than they are in Rosedale, right? If you're new to the city and you, you haven't lived here your whole life, are you familiar with those neighborhood demographics? Because the goal of visualization should ultimately be about insight, you know, not just pretty pictures. There's lots of people in the InfoViz world that talk about that. Um, and so my, my goal is always to get them to connect those, those uh, you know, that, that local grounding that they might have with the data work they're doing in the classroom to create those insights like that. Uh, and then finally, I have this past year and a half, I've been teaching through the pandemic, uh, a, a final major assignment that's, uh, you know, having them create a human centered data story with COVID as the kind of anchor for it. So they have to take things like um, you know, they, they can take data about farm workers getting COVID in, in Bradford and Newmarket and so on, or they can look at uh, the population of, uh, of Toronto jails and, and COVID outbreaks there. They can look at food insecurity. I had a student that just finished a project on food insecurity in Parkdale uh, and its relationship to, to COVID rates. So, uh, so that one is, is really much more complex. It requires about five or six weeks of pretty extensive um, work with their chosen data set, whatever it may be. And I give them a few examples. And then I have them present it uh, in some form of you know, data storytelling visual. So uh, we do a lot of work in the kind of data journalism context where they'll, they'll be familiar with these sort of scrolly telling JavaScript, you know, web-based uh, uh, libraries. And I'll have them literally build a scrolling data story. Um, ArcGIS has a great story maps tool that works well for that. For, for my students who don't have any programming background, I like to direct them there. And, and you know, that ArcGIS is not the only tool that does it, but we had a license at U of T and lots of universities do. So it's, uh, it, it, it does have a good uh, a suite of tools that can be used. So that's, uh, those are some examples of typical open data projects that I use in my classroom, which is typically more oriented toward design, visual design, graphic design, and so on. Um, so we are going to move next. Anna has shared a form, a Google survey in the 
uh, in the chat window. And maybe I Anna, can yet. you? Yeah, I have not yet. Let, I have to redo it again. Oh, okay. So here we go. So um, yeah, thanks, Gabby. No problem. So Anna, so, can you you want to give a little description there? Yeah, so this uh, Google form is a short Google form. It's just to give us an indication, everybody actually, not just Gabby and I, because we're going to share the results um, with everybody. So it's an anonymous survey. Um, and it's to get a sense of uh, where, if, if you're an educator, where do you use um, uh, data, uh, open data, and how do you use it in a classroom, and what challenges you have uh, perhaps experienced in different particular categories, and maybe the tips that you have. So if you can just take five minutes to do it, use bullet points uh, wherever necessary, uh, and we'd appreciate it. I'm going to then, uh, while you guys are working on some steps later on, um, going through the exercise, I'm going to take that data and I'm going to, whatever your responses, I'm gonna share it for everybody so uh, we can learn collectively. Uh, can you just uh, let me know if you cannot access the survey if there is an issue. I'm filling it out now. I, uh, yeah. So hopefully no issues. Ah, so I don't think it's going to be. Okay, so yeah. So Anna, for non educator, it looks like there is only one question. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, because if you're not so when so let me uh, have you reconsider. Do you ever teach anything that is related to that? So I'm not talking about like, are you a professor or a teacher? But even in your workplace, do you run any workshops or run any courses, etc. So in that particular case, choose educator and then look at the answer, look at the questions. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the courses, I don't think the courses check boxes are mandatory anyway, right? No. Yeah. Just answer whichever questions you can answer. Okay. I didn't look at the time, so maybe another. Um, I've got two it minutes here. Or three minutes. Another two minutes, yeah. Two minutes or so. And most of you guys, I can see that you're checking that you're not educators. Um, are you still finding this uh, this conversation useful so far? Even though it does not necessarily. Uh, so, uh, it's pre. Stephen, very good questions. Rating student literacy. It's pre, uh, pre, pre course. So students coming into the course. Thank you for that. That's, uh, I'm going to add that to the questionnaire. I just finished the uh, survey myself. I took a few minutes for that. Okay, thanks. So probably one more minute or so.
And remember, these are going to be published, right? So don't put any sort of personal information in there, right? So whatever, they're not going to be published, but they're going to be shared widely. So. So guys, just post yeah. in the chat if you need any extra time. But we should be good to, to move on, I think. Yeah, so if somebody is still sort of finishing up, maybe while you're talking uh, about the introduction to the hands-on, Gabby, um, sure. they can wrap it up then. Yeah, okay. feel free to, to continue typing away while we're moving on to the next step. OK, so the next step here. Um, we're going to walk through a sort of simple classroom based exercise, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in a classroom setting. You could do this like Anna mentioned, for those of you who aren't educators, you could do this in a workplace. Uh, it's really meant to be about an hour long, maybe a little bit less, uh, but a basic simple exercise to help develop some familiarity with, with, with fairly low hanging fruit, easy tools, simple data set to work with. Um, but potentially lots of challenges and hurdles along the way. So uh, so what we're gonna be working with here, and we're actually gonna ask that, you know, if you if you want, and I think it will be will be ideal for you uh, to sort of walk along with us at home. Um, we've tried to make this as accessible and simple uh, as possible. So uh, please feel free to sort of walk along through the steps at home. And if you want, so uh, I'm just going to actually get a link here and drop it into the chat because we have a hands-on, I've, I've organized these into slides, but I also have a single sort of two-page uh, instruction sheet. So let me just drop that link into the chat for you. Um, anyone on the internet with the link can edit it. Okay, please don't edit it in uh, an inappropriate way. There we go. Boom. So if you want to just have a, a simple two-page instruction, it contains all the same information that I'm going to walk through in the slides. And at some point, I'm going to jump out of the slides and go into very specific uh, uh, tools. OK, so the purpose of this exercise, we're going to be doing this kind of hands on uh, little half hour exercise with the consumer price index uh, data set. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the com consumer price index? Anyone? Anyone? I'm used to teaching online, so I'm, I'm used to like asking a lot of questions and being like, hey, students, please answer something in the chat window and I watch over here. Um, so you got okay, four so thumbs up. What's that? Four thumbs up. Fantastic. Well, this is the problem with Zoom, right? We can't have the little thumbs up going. Um, but all right, that's fantastic. I assume maybe there, there's real people on the other end of the avatars there. Um, okay, so so uh, here's here's the purpose of this. What we really want to be doing is uh, is giving students a very simple and easy and accessible uh, uh, approach to finding and working with data. Okay, that fits or ties in with our curriculum. Um, but we want them to learn how to access the data, how to work with it a little bit, and then do some basic analysis on it, and then visualize or make sense of what they find. So there's sort of a, a stepwise order going on here. Now, in this case, we've chosen this consumer price index data because Anna uses it in the classroom, in her math curriculum. Um, I haven't used it for visualization stuff in my own class, but it's I've definitely used related data sets many, many times. So it's it's uh, it's the kind of data set that you can get from, you know, from StatsCan. Uh, you can get comparable ones from the US or the EU. Uh, and, and it's really an interesting one for thinking about where the economy is heading. Uh, you know, what what sort of pressures there are on Canadian families in the context of an election, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what, what is the CPI? It, it basically tracks changes in prices as experienced by Canadian consumers by comparing over time the cost of fixed uh, goods and services. So we'll, we'll, we'll show you a little bit about that. We'll show you how to get more information about it. So in uh, a process like this, uh, students will typically engage in, in up to four tasks and sometimes even beyond that. Uh, the first is that they need to go and access or read about or, or, or you know, maybe watch some YouTube videos about the data set. And then they need to download and, and engage with it, typically in a table editor like Excel or Google Sheets. Um, for those of you who want to chime in in the chat, what's your preference? Excel, Google Sheets, 
uh, command line? What do you what do you guys typically use for uh, for interrogating a data set, if you will? Pandas, any pandas users? R. <laughs> oh, we got some R people here. Fantastic. I'm a pandas person myself, and I don't mean the, the little bears. We got some Excel people. Great. Um, Okay, so so they'll they'll typically like giving especially novice low data literacy students the capacity to use table editors is much easier than saying here we're going to do this all in pandas and you have to learn how to program in Python right away. Um, it's a little easier for them to understand what's going on. So the next step is they'll engage in a very simple modeling exercise using really simple statistical methods. Now in Anna's math class, those methods will become more complex. And she'll spend more time talking about what's going on. Sometimes in my class, I'll, I'll uh, you know, if, if we're doing something that's beyond summary statistics, I'll explain what's going on in, in the background. Because I hate the idea of them just, you know, dumping some data into a black box and turning the, you know, grinding the gears a little bit and it spits something out and they have no clue what's going on. So I typically like to explain if there's some complex statistical methods or some modeling going on, I like to explain what it is that's happening so they have a better sense if they need to explain it to someone else down the road. Um, so following this kind of second statistical slash modeling uh, uh, step, the next step is for them to generate uh, in, in some cases, just one or two visualizations, but today we're, got, we're actually going to generate a report, a simple standard report using, uh, today we're going to use Google Data Studio, but you could use Tableau, um, you, can use, you can use plain old docs, right? You don't need to use anything complex. Obviously, if you want to build a dashboard, there's a million tools for that as well. Um, or if you want to build a really complex report, if you want to, you know, uh, make a data warehouse and do everything in SAP and you've got, you know, some, some SAP analytics cloud, great. That's, that's another possibility, but it's probably not what you're going to do with your generic classroom that's just encountering open data for the first time. So Google Data Studio is great for simple reports. Um, quite, I wouldn't say always intuitive, but fairly intuitive for students. Uh, and then in the final step, uh, we'll have the students, in this case you, clean up visual design and explore a number of different visualization techniques, uh, aesthetic choices, layouts, etc. Okay, so that's the, the sort of overall scope of the project. Um, we're using Google products for this assignment uh, today, and, and I would recommend that you would probably do so as well. For, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're available at TDSB schools, okay? So if you're working with students, especially you know high school students or whatever, uh, they're gonna have Google products. They're familiar with using Google Drive. They're familiar with using Google Sheets, et cetera. I mean, my, my grade four, well, now grade five kid uh, has been using Google Sheets for two years, right? He doesn't know what Excel is, even if it looks exactly the same, but he can work with, with Sheets. And our students at Ontario Tech, uh, my former students at Ryerson, my former students at, at U of T, they all use Google stuff extensively. They, in, in not as many cases, use Excel. Okay, so that's something to be familiar with. So I see, like, in that question I asked about what tools you use, I see Excel, 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 you know, in the chat window there. Think about, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not a big Google booster, but think about why there would be some advantages to using Google there. Um, beyond that, most students are going to have a Google account anyway. So that's the advantage of using Google tools for this. Um, so the instructions that we've created here are really meant to be super simple, you know, low hanging fruit, nothing crazy complex initially. Um, and, and they should be interchangeable with really any, any simple data set that you, uh, that you expect to use. That said, before you use them, before, if you were to take this set of instructions and port it into your own class or, or your own workshop that you're going to teach at your, your, your company or your organization, uh, ask yourself, if you're going to change to a different data set, ask yourself what might be interesting about that data set with respect to your specific curriculum. You know, what are the important variables in it? Uh, what are the questions that your students will find interesting or your coworkers will find interesting? What are the knowledge gaps that might exist? Okay, and then what are the potential pitfalls, right? Things like you're, you're putting a bunch of links in here. I've got links to StatsCan stuff. Links change all the time, all right? You have to make sure they're fresh. 
Uh, you gotta change, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna jump in. You wanna change the slide to the next yep. one? Because there's no, no links problem. yet. Yeah, there yep. we go. Yeah, so so this is going to be the step one. So so if I give you this and you go and share it to your students, uh, you know those links might change. The portals that you use, if you say, hey, use Google for this and then Tableau for the next thing, those portals are all different. All the software applications have different layouts and different user interfaces, so they can be a big challenge to use. Uh, and then next, will the tools that you use uh, or that you choose to use be intuitive for your students? All right. Remember, our primary objective as instructors, whether it's for a workshop or a classroom, isn't necessarily to teach a new software application, right? I'm not teaching you Tableau. I want to teach you how to work with an open data set for our math curriculum or our visualization curriculum or what have you. Um, so how will you deal with the challenges that your students might face, right, around not knowing how the software application works, uh, can they read the instructions that you've given them? Uh, do you have enough time for them to learn all this stuff, right? Um, so Anna's got this great tip that she, she mentioned to me that I haven't really thought of doing, but this is, this is something uh, that, that makes sense for all of you. Um, keep track of all the challenges that your students are finding while they're going through the process. So have them regularly report, report into the chat, chat window or into a document, hey, I, uh, you know, this link didn't work or this button was broken or something didn't make sense here, okay? Um, all right, so let's go through some of this stuff. So each of these steps should typically take about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the data literacy uh, kind of bar that's set for your students. Um, if you're not going to be doing this with your, uh, if you are going to be doing this live with your students, you should probably multiply that time range by, you know, about like uh, uh, three or four, somewhere around there. May, it, it's going to take you a lot longer. Okay. So here's what we're going to walk through these steps right now. Um, the, the very first thing is, and this, all you guys at home, you can follow along at home with me. Um, we're going to go and read about the data. And I'm literally just going to click through and show you some of this stuff. Anna's posted in the chat there. Uh, whoops, let me jump back there. Come back, Google. Let's see if it will allow me to, there it goes. Okay, so we're going to go and read about the data. So in this case, I've provided my students, you, um, with a, a web page that shows me some information about the data. Set. So I'm going to go and click on that and have them spend a little bit of time reading about it, understanding what the CPI is all about. Um, you know, it's coming from StatsCan and StatsCan has a pretty good infographics team. So I can go and maybe read an infographic or two about it. Uh, I can check out some analysis. I can do all these different things with it. But I want to give them this kind of biography of the data set first. I want them to understand what we're looking at. Okay, next step. We want them to access the specific data set. How are we doing uh, in terms of pacing? Are you guys able to sort of follow along at home with the chat window there? You can just chime in in the chat. I'm watching that as well. I've got a couple windows here. Perfect. Okay, so the next thing is we're gonna have them access the specific data set. So here I've provided a link in the instructions and here we've got the actual one from the StatsCan user interface Obviously, if I'm going to the Durham Region Open Data Portal or the Toronto Open Data Portal or some other open data portal, I might be using an API. I might be using a table editor like this. There's lots of different, different ways to access it. But you might need to spend a little bit of time with them, you know, figuring out what do I need to grab? What, what are the things that I need to get from this? Okay. So in this case, uh, with this CPI data and for Anna's class in particular, she asks them to get a base range, uh, the, to set the baseline at, two, at the year 2000, not at 2016. The default reference period is 2016 from StatsCan. So we've added a little instruction for them to adjust the date range. Okay, so I'm gonna set that down to 2000. And okay, now I'm good to download my data, right? Nope. So I actually need to go and click apply. All right, because it's not right now, it will only give me 2016 to 2020. And that's something, you know, you, I guarantee you, your students, if you say change the date range from two, 2000 to 2020, they're going to use that little drop down and then they're going to go and download and be like, why didn't my project work? For sure. So you have to make sure if it's something super 
simple that that you would you know for you it makes perfect sense to click apply don't assume that your students will look at our table now completely different all right so now i've got my full table here um and i'm ready to to move forward a little bit so our, the next step in our instruction is to download the csv all right here's the thing will your students know what csv means will they have a clue uh, do they know the difference between an Excel SX file and a CSV file or a TXT file or any of the other file formats that they might encounter? You know, shape files, if you're working with geodata, for example, um, all manner of different files that they might encounter. So you might have to say, OK, this is a comma save values file. Uh, it's used in data work for such and such a purpose. You know, here's why it's preferable to working with a CSV rather than a, an Excel file, et cetera. So when you're saying download CSV, give them a little bit of instruction. So we're going to go and download our CSV. I don't know if you guys, sometimes Zoom doesn't show you the, the pop-up windows unless I do like a full screen. So you might not see when I clicked on download options. Do you see all my options window? Yes, perfect. Okay, so I have, look at this, stats can, typical. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different download types that I can go with. What's the right one? Well, you're gonna have to figure that out in advance and say, all right, what do I wanna actually have my students working with? For now, we'll just download the, the as displayed, simple, fairly straightforward. It's, uh, it's not a huge file, okay? If you download the entire table, then you're dealing with, you know, a couple megs worth of, of space, it can be a, a problem for your students, um, especially if you're working live. Okay, so we've downloaded our CSV. I've got it sitting in my, my downloads folder. Uh, keep in mind, and this is a huge problem for, for lots of students, they're like, where did my file go? Some of them have it on their messy desktops. Some of them it's in their downloads. Some of them it goes to their documents. I work on a Linux machine, so I don't even know what their, you know, what their their uh, file structures are like. Like it's, you you have to anticipate that in advance because you will have ten students going. I don't know where the file went. I they opened it and saved it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so so you will have to guide them through that process. All right, so we've got import into Google Sheets. Um, so Anna dropped in a nice little link here for Google Sheets for Google Spreadsheets. Um, hopefully, some of you are familiar with this. I'm going to go click and open my Google Spreadsheets. All right. And Google Spreadsheets, if you're in Google Drive over here, I can go and click New File Upload, and I can pull that CSV in and start working with it. In Google Sheets, I actually have to go and create a new uh, spreadsheet. And then I'm going to go and right click it or click over here and go Import. And now I'll pull in my brand new stats can you know go over to upload select from my device hopefully my fonts are really small hopefully you guys get what i'm doing and now i want to go to downloads and i'm going to get my my new file there and it's going to say should it replace the spreadsheet should it detect the separator type just tell them to use the default stuff google's machine learning systems are pretty advanced they know what to look for all right, so I'm importing my data now and we should be good to go. Oh, lo and behold, what's this? Hopefully you guys can all see what's happening here. So StatsCan loves to include all of this extra stuff in their sheets when you download it, okay? If you're used to working with a lot of open data, you don't get all these like headers with instructions and all these footnotes and all this other stuff right? You're used to just a simple table view. Okay. So that's something right away. You're going to need to spend a little bit of time cleaning up and figuring out what you want to keep and what you don't. So in our case, maybe we'll take just the, the table, right? And you'll have to show them, all right, click here, shift select to select the rows you want. Uh, we'll control X to cut, uh, to, to cut it. I want to go down here and add a sheet and boom. Okay, so now I've got my new spreadsheet that's just the table data, right? That's that's all I want. I don't want all this uh, additional stuff, right? 
But lo and behold, you have to be careful because again, stats can stuff will throw you some of these weird little like here are the rows you have here, you know, all this other stuff. So I actually want to get rid of that. I'm going to go and nuke that, that row. So I'll right click it or I'll click into there and delete that row. Now I have a more reasonable table to work with. Um, so we're going to do, we've got about 15 minutes. I don't want to take a huge amount of time for this. Some of the other steps you, you, uh, you will have to do at home, but I want to show you how to basically make a couple of very simple uh, charts in here. So let's say we want to do uh, just a simple, a simple chart to see trends for the last little while. I want to take all items, for example. Um, and I'm going to go and uh, select a row. You know, we'll just select this row in this case. And I'm going to go insert chart. And Google is pretty good about figuring out what you might want to see. Now, I don't have my, my date range on there. Okay, so I might want to change that up. So let's actually nuke this chart. We'll delete it. And I'm going to copy these two rows now. I'm going to go insert chart. And now I get my actual date range. Okay. And I know that I'm looking at all items, but it's added a bunch of stuff because I have this little header name up here that doesn't work. So I'm going to have to go and clean that out. I want to see all items. Uh, and this is everything in the CPI. Okay, I want to see how it's growing. How is the consumer price index going up? Now notice when I hover over it, I get a little scatter chart in the background. The line chart and scatter chart uh, 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 operations in Google uh, Sheets work pretty well together. So this is similar to what you would do in Excel. You guys are all familiar with this, I, I hope, or, or maybe not. Um, but that's one simple way to throw together a simple chart, drop it in there. Obviously, you have this chart editor here where if I go into setup, I can switch from line chart, I can use a column chart, okay? Uh, it's going to give me some suggested recommendations here. Um, but then I have lots of different, not lots, but I have a few different chart types that I can work with, okay? That can be a problem if you just say to your students, make a visualization and you don't tell them what one, all right? So you need to guide them through that process a little bit. All right, so in our instructions there, we've got... Uh, you know, try out some different different rows here. Let's go back to our line chart and let's actually redo this quickly with just a, uh, I'm going to delete that and I'm going to get rid of all items and I want to shift select, oops, I'm going to shift select one, two, or control select one, eee, one, where's my control button? There we go, two, three. I want to compare food and shelter. Uh, over the years. So we're going to add our little chart there now. And now I can see our food and shelter prices both going up. Yes, they are. There's my proof. All right. Now it's looking a little bit nicer for me. Okay. So that's our, our simple, basic learning about the CPI data. Okay. Um, so some, some notes for you as instructors. You should think about what a good evocative date range would be. Right? Is this baseline of 2000 to 2020, is that, is that what you would typically work with in your curriculum? Um, what, what if we focused on Harper years to the Trudeau years? Right? Uh, will your students uh, 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 understand, I've got an instruction here that says, consider transposing your table into a, a new sheet and updating the headers okay, to switch it from wide to long. What is that? Do they know what transpose mean? Do they know why that might be beneficial to their, their data work? Um, so that's our, our, our simple little introduction to doing this with Google Sheets. I don't think we have enough time. We're already at, at close to 10 minutes to the hour. Um, I'll just show you the, the next set of instructions and, and describe some things that are going on there. Uh, we won't walk through them all because it takes a little bit too much time. Um, and we want to have a little bit of a, a brainstorm, a collective brainstorm uh, uh, afterward. But the, the next step, and this is really tied to this, uh, this, this example that Anna has shared in the, the, the folder. Um, this is basically doing the same thing I did just now in, in Google Spreadsheets, but actually adding a trend line. I should actually be able to do it if I still have the, the thing open there. Let's see if I can... Um, no, I don't want to escape it, but basically uh, adding a trend line to, to do some, some basic linear regression. Let me see if I can pop this open, shift alt tab. Nope. 
Uh, no, it won't do it without causing too many problems for the presentation. So I won't bother right now. Um, but we've got some simple instructions here for adding in a linear regression. Um, this corresponds with what Anna's instructions are for, for doing it in Excel. The problem here, uh, and, and this is something that, you know, a math curriculum uh, educator would probably already anticipate, but students have a drop down menu that helps them choose what type of trend line. Is it linear? Is it logarithmic? What are the other options? Anna, what, what kind of hurdles do your students face when they, you know, accidentally hit the wrong one? Well, the, yeah, so there's a couple of things they can uh, accidentally hit, you know, hit the wrong one and then not stop and think, does this make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Or they might choose one that doesn't make sense. So let's say I'm talking about a data set that talks about percentages and they choose linear. Well, right. this linear is going to shoot over 100% in no time. That doesn't work, right? It's got to be something different. So those are the kinds of things that the students uh, struggle beyond just sort of like technical. Where do I click? <laughs> oh, it disappeared. <laughs> How do I change it? You tell me to show the equation. What do you mean by show the equation? I can't read that equation. All of those issues that, so it's going to really depend on the maturity of the student and the sort of the level of experience that they have. How detailed you have to be in your instructions. Right. Yeah? So. We've got some some notes as well in our presentation notes that we'll share. Um, so a, a couple notes about styling at this stage, right? Because if you're asking students to build, say, a trend line, uh, are that what are they noticing? What is their audience going to notice, right? Have you asked them also to push the scatter plots or the all the individual line charts? If you've got ten line charts on a single uh, on a single figure, have you asked them to? crank up the opacity on those so that they, you know, they're, 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 they're muted. They're in the background where your single trend line is the thing that's in the foreground, the thing that the, that you want your audience to see. So making sure that as they go through the kind of styling and aesthetic process, uh, it's not just about better titles and better fonts. Uh, it, it also includes things like grid lines and whether your background is dark or light. And are you highlighting the one thing that you're really asking your, your viewer, your, your reader to pay attention to? So that's something that students don't always, you know, they're not familiar with that, those, uh, those sort of design aspects of it. And if you look at major uh, data news organizations, The Economist or 538, they've spent years and have very detailed and thoughtful processes about their styling. They've got style guides about, you know, how dark the grids are supposed to be and what, you know, if you're highlighting a specific uh, element in a graph, you know, how are you doing it? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll just uh, show you really quick uh, before we, we step to this collaborative exercise to finish up, I just want to show you uh, Google Data Studio because some of you may not be familiar with it. And it is a really powerful tool for taking some of this stuff that we've got now and, uh, uh, and, and generating reports. So when I open up Google Data Studio, it's datastudio.google.com. Um, sometimes you will actually need to go and, uh, and do a kind of setup process. Okay, but let's say I, I, I want to create a blank report. Um, I click on that. I've done my, my setup for it. Google Data Studio has this really neat connections option where you can link to either a, a downloaded CSV that you've created and cleaned up and you know, done all your munging and everything, or you can link directly to a, a worksheet within the spreadsheet that you had, had previously created. And then as you can see here, there's a million different connectors that you, can, uh, that you can link to as well, which makes it a very, very powerful tool for building reports. But if I were to just take that file that, uh, that I've, I've previously created, I've already cleaned up one worksheet and stored it in my, my computer here. I've got a cleaned table. Um, the, the challenge here is Google Data Studio can sometimes take a little bit of time. Yeah, right now I'm getting an error saying refresh the page because it doesn't like it when Zoom's open. So that's something where you'll, you'll need to anticipate if you're doing like uploading a data set or linking to a data set in Google Sheets, you may have something break in, in the process there. Um, but I can probably, well, let's, let's see, fingers crossed, it might show you one that I've already created. So you can get a sense of what the reports look like. Um, so this is basically a report from the previous thing. Um, 
in this case, I've added a chart. If I go click edit up here, I did all these, these little charts here myself. Um, in, you know, I added a chart in this case, and I have multiple options more than in, in a typical Google spreadsheet. Um, I can add things like scorecards and trend lines. And if I have actual time series data, uh, I, I don't need to just use a quote unquote line chart. I can actually use a time series chart. Um, even though they look the same, there's some different operations going on in the background. Um, but the nice thing about this is it generates it in a report like format where I can include the table. I can put some text down in the bottom for my descriptions. I can add images for logos and things like that. And there's some default custom styling that, that makes it a little bit easier, a little bit more uh, user friendly in terms of the way it's, it's represented. So you don't need to spend as much time thinking about the aesthetics. As well, changing the, the, the backdrop, changing the canvas is pretty straightforward. Switching to you know, a portrait, US portrait style uh, paper if I wanted to print it versus say a 16 uh, by nine aspect ratio for a, a web-based display. So there's lots of different components of this. Um, we've included them in this kind of generator report with some notes in there. Uh, and then we have a final sort of slide talking about the, the you know, how, how should you go about cleaning up your visual design? What are some of the things you should consider? Um, so that actually takes us right close to the end, but we do wanna, uh, we have hopefully a couple minutes that we can do a little bit of a collective brainstorm. Um, we have two minutes. Oh, that's it. <laughs> two okay. minutes, that's it. So um, if you, uh, so let me just share, uh, I shared earlier a link to, because you guys can hear me. Yeah, I, I did yes. uh, put myself on Google. So all of the documents related to the conversation today or the presentations are related in this shared folder. You can also see I added the responses from the survey. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can confirm for me that you can actually see the response sheet. Yes. There we go, it's right there. So most people, so anyway, so you can, we can look at this um, later. It's also, uh, you, if you look into the worksheet, thank you Gabby for opening it up. Can you uh, show the open data, so the sources? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Very good. So uh, we oh. set this up as a collaborative, right? So if you guys are know of open data sources that are useful that you have used, please add them in there. And then similarly, if you can scroll Gabby down, you're looking for various tools, right? That you can you could use, as well as at the bottom, I think it's the visualization, uh, visual, visualization tools. So you can use these uh, as you're exploring your own projects, but please also help the rest of us. <laughs> if you're using something that is really, you find really useful, please add there. And let me um, put yeah, in a poll here for the uh, Open Data Society, which on both its French and English language websites has a page with some of this information, including something called dataportals.org, which purports to be a complete global listing of open data portals. I think we've got dataportals.org in here somewhere. Very good. I'm going to drop it in anyway here. Yes, excellent. Yeah, I, I, I am sorry, but we do have to stop. We got it. We got, we got to run it. Um, the, the last one is just, there's one more document that is also collaborative sharing. Uh, if you can add any challenges uh, or tips that you might have on the different aspects of the project and then uh, or the rest of us, everybody can sort of learn from you. Can I tweet this or <laughs> no, I, I won't tweet this, but I wanna share it at least with our subscribers. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So this should be um, or shareable to everybody. Excellent, I will do that early next week when I've taken a deep breath from the Canadian Open Data Summit, which starts tomorrow at 10, 15 a.m. Register now or you will not be able to see it. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Uh, let's uh, wrap it up. Um, if you have any questions, uh, Gabby, if you can put, put our last slide there, you can reach out to Gabby and I um, uh, uh, as well. I hope this was um, informational. I know we speed through it. 
it was really fast. Uh, but hopefully you were able to pick up some uh, useful pieces. Well, the blessing is it's recorded. So, you know, people will be able to take a second look. Uh, I'll send it to all the uh, registrants uh, again uh, next week. <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks for everybody for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you guys.